Hello everyone, my name is Pixlriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, this is episode 100, we are going to do a world tour, recapping all of the stuff that we have built here in this world so far. And while we won't be recapping every single location we've been to, I do want to cover the highlights of this series so far, especially some of the stuff we've been able to build, because even though it feels like we haven't had this world for a great deal of time, it's been six months already since the 1.18 update came out and we've actually accomplished quite a lot here in this world. So of course, where to start but our starter house, for which we are actually going to have to walk away around the side of this geode and down here into this little gully in the land. Because down here, back Behind the wheat field, which I'm trampling as I go over it, this right here was our starter house. Our first little survive your first night cave down here that we converted into a little wooden shack. And on the inside, we even have a couple of pieces of carpet as a doormat. We have one torch making sure that mobs don't spawn in here. And we have some of my first ever tools that we created in this world, plus a little bit of rotten flesh. Most of the stuff that we stocked in here, I did end up moving into the starter house, but... Just so we have it here, our initial set of tools that we were using at the very beginning of this world are right here in this chest in case we want to save them for sentimental reasons and maybe do anything with them in future. Now, of course, our first wheat field came shortly after that and our first animal pen, which still has a bunch of cows in it. I moved the sheep into the sheep farm, but the cows are still here just in case I feel the need to get any milk or any steak, although I'm not really in the market for steak these days now that I'm trading golden carrots from some villagers elsewhere in the world. As you can see, I built up a geode around here because the geode is actually concealing the nether portal, or maybe not concealing it, but highlighting it in a thematic way. We got our nether portal in there, of course, underneath the enchanting setup that got attached to our actual starter house. And we may as well take shelter in there right now because it's just started raining. Inside the starter house, we just got things a little bit cozy. We got a nice little living area set up. We had a fireplace and a chest, which still has a bunch of different types of food in, in case we need to revisit any of those. We have our new dinner bone pig dangling from the ceiling in here and a map of the world so far, which I don't know if I need to update this actually because it might be a little bit behind on what I've actually been building around here. But to be honest, there isn't a huge amount of change that you can really see on the surface here. A lot of the changes are further north, south, east or west in the world and we will cover those a little later. For now though, as we head up here, you can see the world before we started making any of those changes and you'll notice that the mob farm isn't even present in this giant circular lake to the north. So we'll end up dealing with that a little bit later. But up here, <laughs> interrupted only by the fact that we had to tie the lead off to something so that the pig could dangle from the ceiling. We have a little bedroom where it's always nice to come back here and set our spawn every so often. Got some backup gear here in the chest just in case I need it. And we even have a couple of paintings here in a barrel along with some bookshelves just for a bit of decoration if we want it up here. Now that the rain is clearing up, we can step outside and into our lovely little spawn area, which contains some of the starter farms that we were working on. We've got a little cactus farm and one of the first redstone builds that I approach in basically any world, the sugarcane farm. All observer powered and pretty productive as long as we are within this area and the sugarcane can grow. So this has been providing me with paper for firework rockets, villager trades and all sorts of other things besides. There is still a remnant of our manual sugarcane farm over here on one side of the house and we use that to put together our enchanting setup where I've done basically all of the enchanting in this series including combining tools in an anvil which I still need to replace back here but we have a lot of bookshelves from raiding woodland mansions and stuff like that so plenty of opportunity to set up other enchanting setups anywhere we need them. We've also got a wool farm here for all different 16 colors of wool a very nice easy compact design that's been around ever since sheep have been able to be automatically sheared using dispensers and here is our beekeepers cottage which unfortunately I did have to replace all of the flowering azalea leaves with regular birch leaves just so that the bees wouldn't end up trying to pathfind to them but since then it has become a hive of productivity giving us as much honey as we could ever want and in fact more honey than we could ever want because I don't really see myself using that much honey at this point we've also got a ton of honeycomb in here which I've been using for honeycomb blocks and also candles and also sorts of other things besides. We're going to be waxing a lot of copper with that at some point in the near future and unfortunately whilst I was here during the night time a zombie seems to have knocked down the door so until I go and get a replacement door at some stage that's going to remain a trapdoor. 
Across the river, we have the fishing shack where we've done a fair amount of fishing within a little lily pad bridge that we can hop across if I ever get good at parkour, which is unlikely, apparently. In the various barrels around here, we have a few of the spoils of fishing along with some of the equipment that we've used to fish. We've still got a bunch of enchanted rods and bows and books inside of here, and this, I believe, is the fishing rod that I've used most of the time, being the fully upgraded one. But on the inside, we've got a humble little interior, lots of very narrow corridors, and a whole bunch of the stuff that we've gathered from fishing is stored in here, including more nautilus shells and name tags, even another heart of the sea if we wanted to set up another conduit over here, plus all of the junk items and a bunch of the fish in the barrels around the room here as well. Could take those to the fishermen for a bit of trading at some stage. The fishing shack was, of course, one of the first builds that we used copper in, and I'm really happy with the roof of this. Once it all aged, it really came together, and I'm very, very happy with the look of that overall. Over here in this direction, we have the iron farm, which is currently inactive, and let me tell you a little story about that. So after this thing was set up, and I was testing the rates of the iron farm against going out mining for iron manually in one of those huge iron veins, we of course left the iron farm running in perpetuity after that and it has produced a lot of iron. If you've ever seen me dip into my iron storage chests over at my base, that is really just the tip of the iceberg. And while none of these chests are full, they do have a fair amount of iron ingots that I haven't even bothered converting into blocks. In fact, over this world's lifespan so far, the farm produced so much iron that I decided it was probably best to turn it off on a somewhat permanent basis. And if you take a look in here, I don't have my spyglass on me, but I might try and fish it out of the ender chest if it's in here somewhere. Yes, there we go. If you look in here, there are only two villagers, and <laughs> with three villagers, this would be producing iron golems constantly, but with just two villagers inside of there, it's not going to. And the reason it has two villagers is because I wanted to do an episode about the effects that lightning strikes have on different types of mobs, and I decided to get hold of a villager nice and easily. I was actually going to take one from my iron farm and use that to convert it into a witch, kind of killing two birds with one stone in a way, making sure that my iron farm didn't end up overflowing and wasting a ton of iron. Also, reducing the amount of time I have to come back to this farm for the sake of maintenance because honestly I don't really need that much iron in this world quite yet and we got to demonstrate the effects of lightning on villagers turning one into a witch. Really, to re-enable this iron farm, all I would need to do is go up there and chuck a bunch of carrots to those villagers, and then they produce a baby villager, a third villager would grow up in there, and the whole iron farm would start again. So it's fairly easy to disable this thing, and nice and easy to enable it again. But overall, I really like how this farm came together, and it's got some nice easy water streams into a lava trap here for the iron golems to fall into. I like the sort of meteoric impact crater that we created here. With the raw iron blocks around the outside giving it a little bit more character and kind of implying what the farm is here to do to begin with. But eventually we had to have somewhere to store all of that iron and that's where this storage building came in. And to be honest, I'm so happy with the way this build came together. I kind of freestyled it. I just wanted to have some nice clean lines and curves in here. I was kind of thinking of like old school Bakelite radios almost when I built this, but I wanted a bit more of a woodsy aesthetic to it with the greens and browns and all of these natural colors in here. And I thought it came together really well. There are still a few holes in it. I still have never quite finished the structure here, but that is the nature of a lot of these things in my videos. I tend to build what is visible from the outside and then on the inside some stuff gets left unfinished or in this case we don't have the moss wall curving around to complete the outside of this redstone area. But honestly since I don't look at the building from this angle very much I just sort of decided that I should leave that for now and <laughs> focus my materials elsewhere. The storage system up here is a tried and tested one and is honestly getting pretty full in some of these chests. I have so much natural stone and cobblestone from going out and beacon and strip mining in other parts of the world. I believe I still have a fair amount of tough in here from digging out the huge iron vein and we could get a ton more of these resources if we wanted to but there is still plenty of room for other stuff and on my Tuesday live streams over on Twitch I do a lot of wood chopping just so we can have wood for the foreseeable future in this world and so it's always good to have a decent supply in each of these chests. Some of the chests though, for example the dirt chest, the coarse dirt here doesn't really have anything in it. We've got a decent amount of gravel but that's always usable for concrete powder so there's a bunch of stuff in here that I haven't collected in bulk quite yet but naturally we are going to encounter a lot more of these materials in future so I expect we'll run across a couple more of them. Upstairs in the storage system where once again the back wall is mainly unfinished, it's kind of just opens out onto the hill up here, we have our little redstone testing area over here where we did an episode all about the different redstone 
redstone components. And over here we have a wall for a fundraising project that I did for the Belfast Trans Resource Center. So really happy that all of the folks who got their names on this wall were able to donate to a good cause. We got our banners over here with all of the different banner patterns that you can get using banner pattern items, the special banner patterns that you can find and craft. And one of my favorite features of this whole thing is the moss wall inside of here, which I thought was going to be kind of cool to mix in a bit of copper and moss and leaves, and that came together really well. I like the aesthetic of it, and it kind of feels like a modern feature of this relatively modern feeling build. This is also equipped with a shulker box unloader, making sure that we can empty our shulker boxes into the system below, and that goes all the way around the storage system below, making sure that everything gets automatically sorted or dropped off into the overflow cellar, where it can be manually sorted for the areas that we don't have automatic sorting. And up here we have an enderpearl teleporter, and we did do this in a recent episode, and I thought this was going to be a fantastic idea until I realized that building it here presented the problem that this area is not inside the spawn chunks. It is just on the edge of the spawn chunks, but sadly, it is not inside the area. So actually using this to teleport myself back here using an ender pearl wasn't going to be feasible unless we implemented some kind of chunk loader over here or set up an ender pearl relay. So my plan, I think, is going to be to set up an ender pearl teleporter much closer to the center of our world here, perhaps even over there by the house or behind the house, somewhere where it can be a bit more discreet. And then once we teleport back to that area, we can set up another mechanism that's gonna detect when I arrive there. And it's gonna activate the trapdoor here to teleport us a second time straight into the storage system where we can unload all of our items using the shulker box unloader. Speaking of which, down here on the other side, we have the basement where a shulker box loader is ready to get all of the loose items that don't get sorted automatically upstairs and some that end up overflowing from the otherwise full storage that we have up there. And load them into shulker boxes which we can just reload at the touch of a button and drop them in this chest here ready to be sorted. I've even been doing that recently with a couple of the shulker boxes that I brought over from say the dripstone cave base where I'd need to sort a bunch of this stuff into the various chests here which have a loose idea of a sorting system. A lot of them are color coded so for example the redstone stuff goes over here, stuff from the nether goes over here because the nether is largely a red feeling dimension and then over here with the orange wall we've got some of the more natural stuff, we've got some coral and things over here, some of the more brightly colored blocks. All of the mob drops go on these end chests, so we've got a bunch of TNT from the gunpowder that I've been getting, a bunch of bones and bone blocks, ender pearls, all of that kind of stuff, and then spider drops, zombie drops, and even more ender pearls in that chest there. We've got some more organic stuff in the green section, we've got some slime in there as well. This yellow section is largely concerned with stuff like sand and sandstone, we're probably going to put some glass in there as well. And then around the corner, I haven't done a whole lot with this dark green section, but then the blue section here is all about colder stuff like snow and blue biome blocks like prismarine. We've also got hold of a decent amount of purple here since the blue terracotta looks so purple for all of the end dimension stuff. So I'm actually grab the bed in case we need to sleep while we're on our tour here. But loosely speaking, there is a storage system at work here. It's just never one that I've really formalized. And I don't like throwing item frames on every single chest in here. So largely speaking, I've tried to keep the storage fairly minimalist. Over here, we have a super smelter, a 16 furnace auto smelter, which to be honest, was a little bit more trouble than it was worth. And I decided to just swap out the hopper minecart we were using in that episode for a regular chest minecart just to make sure that we could throw all of our items in here and smelt a bunch of them at once without all of the extra finicky redstone stuff that we were trying to do in that episode. Ultimately, it ended up being a simpler design all in all, and I've used this to smelt large amounts of copper and glass and various other things throughout the series. Finally, over here on the left-hand side, we have our little resource nook where we've got a bunch of the resources that we've mined throughout the series. We've obviously got a lot of diamonds, coal, iron, copper, gold, all of that stuff ends up getting stored in here when it's not needed elsewhere. And yes, I do have a decent amount of diamond ore that I haven't bothered fortuning because realistically, I don't use all that much diamond in this world. Once I've got my netherite tools and they've all got mending, I don't need to repair anything. Typically, the only thing you use diamonds for after that are enchanting tables and jukeboxes. So I think the diamond ore is being kept here as a flex and maybe we'll end up building with it at some stage in future. Now our nether portal is behind us right here and that will take us through to the nether hub but before we go there there's a couple more things I want to touch on here at spawn namely the fact that I've been doing occasional bits of terraforming around the area just to make things look a little bit more nice and natural. I like using tough for natural stone terraforming so I'm probably going to use a fair amount of this in future and I like the fact that we've got this little rocky wall around here might end up 
seeding some more features like this in the birch forest here and there. And weeping over the river, we have my attempt at a willow tree, which I think is going to look fantastic once Minecraft 1.19 arrives and we're able to use mangrove leaves, which have that very downward feeling texture as though they are drooping over the water like the leaves of a willow tree would. The other thing is further out here to the north, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it will come into view right about now. Our hostile mob farm, the single set of diamond shaped platforms, all eight of them. I think there are eight of them in this stack. And we definitely need a great deal of gunpowder in this world with all of the flying around that I do. And it's nice to have a decent supply of bones and other drops as well. As you can see from looking in here, I have been doing a bit more AFKing at this farm ever since I mentioned that I was probably going to need to with the shortage of gunpowder here in the world. And it's kind of nice to have a stockpile of all of the other resources here. I think, in fact, it started getting hold of enough string here that the string has to overflow into this last chest and the same with the rotten flesh. So maybe I'll have to take those to trade with some villagers at some stage. Conveniently enough, right nearby is the pillager outpost that we've used for our recent pillager raid experiments. And right over here is the villager in his little trap and the trapped evoker who is still hanging out in here having a wonderful time. He's probably going to stay there until I figure out what else we're going to do with him, but always kind of cool to dip into some Minecraft Easter eggs as we did in the previous episode. And the wandering trader is here for now, but is inevitably going to disappear and might even reappear somewhere else on this tour. Amazingly, I keep remembering stuff that's actually really close to spawn. I was thinking we'd need to go to the nether hub next, but of course down here next to my little tree farming island where I do a lot of the tree chopping on my Tuesday live streams, we have an amethyst geode farm which produces amethyst shards manually if we come through here and fortune the crystals every so often, but super nice to have a decent supply of those so we can recraft amethyst blocks, get tinted glass and all of the other stuff besides, along with the occasional silt touching of the these amethyst crystals because I just like having them for decoration from time to time. Then on the next island over in this little island river archipelago we have this drop down into a nice open cave where I've done a lot of mining and resource gathering in this world. I believe it's where we found some of our first veins of raw material but this is also where we found a couple of mob spawners and down here I believe if there's a, yeah there's a trap door around here if I step down into this this is an early attempt at a spider spawner farm and a pretty successful one at that I was really happy with how this one came together unfortunately we haven't used this all that much for the amount of effort that we put into it because frankly I don't find a single spider spawner all that useful but I do still have a bone of arthropod sword here in case we feel like grabbing a bunch of drops from them and we never quite figured out the spider jockey issue but that's fine it's just kind of fun to mess around with the spawners and see what we can come up with and of course even further down in this cave if we take the somewhat winding and circuitous route to find it and uh, <laughs> here's a, a thematic reminder of what is down here we have our zombie spawner xp farm which should still work as far as i'm aware i don't think i've made any modifications to it and yeah it sounds like it's spawning zombies inside of there nice and easily once again we never really ended up using this to its fullest potential because all i really wanted from it was a couple of easy zombie drops like carrots and potatoes so that we could establish our first carrot and potato farms and it's kind of absurd how easily we we're able to get a carrot right then when at the time I was kind of squeezed for that stuff I was really hoping that we'd get some carrots and potatoes from some random zombies and it took us establishing a mob spawner to be able to kill enough zombies that we eventually got one okay that's more or less it for the spawn area so I think it's finally time to step on through the geode portal here and go to the nether hub and I call this a nether hub because it is really just a loose collection of portals that take us to the different landmarks in this world but we're situated here in the middle of a crimson forest so things can get a little bit hairy here if I'm not wearing a gold helmet <laughs> although taking out a couple of piglins occasionally is not too difficult over here we have a route through to our storage system so that we have a nice quick portal over there and kind of demonstrating how close portals in the nether can really be this path goes all the way through to the portal to the stronghold one of three strongholds that I managed to cite portal at just to make sure that we know where we're going and up here are a couple of ice boat roads that lead out to some landmarks which we won't be visiting on the tour because it's really just for access to the different biomes I haven't really built anything there quite yet but this warped wood lined pathway goes all the way out to the cold biomes of the world the snow plains and the frozen ocean where we've been before and this one here goes all the way out to the hot biomes of the world namely a badlands biome that I discovered several thousand blocks away in the world and it's just a bit of a pain flying there every time so an ice boat road using blue ice is a fast way of getting there. Stepping out into the slightly more organized section of the hub here, I still never quite cleared away the old 
bartering farm where I had built everything on a diagonal because I don't want to break those chests with all of these piglins around. They get mad at me and they start running. Anyway, we have here our finished bartering farm, a slightly more straightforward design on account of it meaning that the piglins don't end up picking up gold from between the two cells and end up with one piglin being starved of gold. All of the drops from this farm end up going into these chests, which then get hopper dropped into a storage system down here, which has all of the different piglin drops sorted into individual chests. And all of the unstackable ones go down here at the very end where we've got a bunch of books, boots, and bottles. I really like the way the wall design came together in here. I quite like the combination of basalt and honey blocks with a little bit of shroom light down there as lighting. And over here we have a basalt generator after we demonstrated that basalt can generate super fast here in the nether so might be doing a bit more farming of this in future for some upcoming builds for now though this pathway leads down to the nether fortress which is something that we haven't really done a great deal with actually i could use some of the blaze spawners around here for a blaze rod farm but we haven't really had the need this pathway goes out towards the desert where once again i haven't done anything in the way of projects i just go over there to gather sand occasionally and we might return there to do a village transformation project at some stage in future. The nether hub also has quick access to a couple of projects which are just far enough away from spawn that having portals to them is kind of convenient. So if I skip my way on down here, if we go through that portal there, that will take us to the jungle biome that's relatively close to spawn, but where I established one of the first nether portals in the world. We repaired a ruined portal in order to get that one going, and over here we actually have portal access to a triple cave spider spawner farm in an abandoned mineshaft in a lush cave across the ocean from where we spawned. And while I'm really happy with the way this farm came together, once again, after I started getting mob drops automatically using that giant mob farm, I haven't really stepped back into this and used it very often. We have better XP farms in the world now, we have all of the spider eyes we could possibly want, and we get string any number of other ways. But I really think no farm that I've ever made before has really combined spiders and tropical fish so successfully. So I'm still pretty proud of this thing, and maybe we'll revisit it in future to give it a bit of a makeover, because right now, design-wise, this is all very functional and not very pretty looking. Stepping back into the nether though, a lot of the landmarks of this world are really down this tunnel here, and it's a tunnel that I am absolutely terrible at flying down, I probably need to widen it out one of these days. This dirt path right here goes out to the Savannah Village, which we may as well visit, although I haven't really done a great deal in terms of transforming that one quite yet. The idea behind the Savannah Village was to work with villagers in a more organic environment, basically in their natural habitat without changing too much about the village itself. That said though, I did decide to make this more of a market square for the villagers so that we could have easier access to trading with all of them, and so all of the workstations are kind of arranged around here, with a couple of notable exceptions being the stonemason, the cartographer, and the cleric who lives over there, and all of the beds here just make sure that they can get up in the morning, have a meeting and get on with their work day. This was also where we started farming iron golems for the first time on the little campfire that's over here, and as you can see the iron golem population does get a little bit out of control on occasion. But I don't spend too much time over here aside from occasionally visiting to trade with librarians, sometimes the fletchers if we want to get a bunch of emeralds from the string, and sometimes the farmer so I can get hold of some golden carrots. Really it was just an exercise in trading with all of the villagers up until their maximum trade level and seeing what they had for us, so I'm really happy that we did this kind of project, but I think in future we'll confine our trading to more organized trading halls, because it can get a little bit chaotic here in this village. If we divert our attention this way though in the nether hub, we end up going through the portal to our dripstone cave, which I tried to keep thematic to the cave itself, although ghasts have occasionally come from the soul sand valley and blown up parts of it. But once we step through into the overworld and through our massive geode portal, this is the area that I've been hanging my hat for the last little while. This is turning slowly into a large kind of dwarven mining themed area with lots of machinery and industrial stuff going on. The dwarves mining into the landscape here for copper and potentially finding more than they bargained for. But to start off with, we've got a lovely standing geode portal here, which I really love the expansion of the Minecraft geode idea into a few other materials and a lot larger construction, plus all of those crystals around the portal I still think look amazing. We have a dripstone farm over here, not that we need it because this cave has provided more dripstone than I really 
really know what to do with. And here, finally fully oxidized, we have a bubble column elevator that takes us up to a platform that I've been thinking of as the foreman's roost, but for now is really just a storage area for me to gather a bunch of things that I need for the eventual transformation of this cave. From up here, we can see a little better the lumber operation they have going on here to produce equipment for the mine and all sorts of other things besides. Some of these ideas are not quite fully finished yet, but I'm sure we'll be able to put some more details in over time. Now down here, if we get down to the cave floor, we actually have a couple of interesting little farms down here, such as this glow lichen farm, which once we activate it, provides us with a ton of glow lichen on a corner here and would be even more efficient if we brought some more efficient shears with us. We have a lava farm arranged around one of these giant dripstone pillar formations, which we can grab buckets and buckets of lava into and throw them into this chest where they're taken down to a blast furnace auto smelter. And right here, we have everything we need to farm warped and crimson fungus and foliage, convert all of that back into bone meal and use that to grow warped and crimson trees, which I normally do on these little 3x3 patches here, but occasionally I've been taking them back to spawn to grow nearer to our storage system. The most recent feature and one of my favorite things that I've done in this world so far is this mineshaft, which instead of being an abandoned mineshaft like the ones that generate in Minecraft naturally is a bit more of an organized mineshaft that the dwarves have dug here themselves and they've encountered a bit of prismarine as they've been digging into here, kind of implying that this is a mystical, magical material that nobody quite knows the properties of yet. But this was a start at looking at how we could use areas like this kind of creatively and guide the player around an experience, which is something that I plan on taking into some future Minecraft episodes in a really interesting way. At the end of the mineshaft here though, we have our redstone flying machine, which, yep, is still really loud, but I'm very, very happy with this because it feels like one of the truly thematic elements of this area. Once it reaches the bottom of the elevator shaft here, it leads out into another cave tunnel that can lead out towards our copper aging factory. And this is really one of the things I am proudest of, not just in this series, but in my overall Minecraft career. As a redstone contraption that I've designed basically from the ground up myself, I'm just so happy with how everything has gone with this contraption. And for the most part, it's working pretty well. I still have a couple of minor teething issues to work out with some of the flying machines resetting the shovels in here that count off the stages of copper as it ages. But for the most part, the copper blocks are being ejected from all of these cells and everything seems to be running as it should do. In fact, of this row, only this one here is being stubborn and holding out, but it looks like the machine is counting it correctly, so that's all good. And while it's going to have to wait until the machine is fully built and once we figured out all of the redstone circuitry and stuff for us to decorate this thing, I am planning on having a long walkway running down through this area that's going to connect to that mineshaft tunnel over there. So it really is going to make a lot more sense when I'm able to finish this project off and decorate it. But that's once again something that we're probably going to do on live streams more often than not because I think people are probably sick of seeing this in videos at this point. <laughs> Maybe we'll return to it in future if there is a tutorial that makes sense for the operation of this thing, but for the moment I think we're probably safe leaving it alone and moving on to other projects. Before we leave and head back to spawn, because I know for a fact I forgot a couple of things over there that I still need to show you, and I expect people are leaving comments letting me know that I forgot them already, we might as well visit our villager trading hall around here, which is one of the first proper trading halls that that I've set up in this area just to make sure that we had a decent supply of clerics with whom we can trade redstone dust because that machine down there needs a whole lot of redstone components so it was nice to have a decent supply around here and all of the villagers sat on their workstations or with a workstation nearby have been happily trading me redstone dust since they were installed here. There's even a lightning rod nearby to make sure that they are immune from lightning strikes but at least this was an opportunity to take a look at jungle villagers some of whom are in here and some of them are the more regular plains villager outfit but I do like the idea that we've got a few jungle villagers here in a more prehistoric feeling area. That is of course fed by an automatic villager breeder which is concealed here <laughs> behind this bank of dirt and inside here two farmer villagers are farming away gathering crops and will occasionally breed another villager but since I don't spend a huge amount of time AFK in this area and the dripstone cave base is a little bit too far away for them to really react to their surroundings most of the time we don't need to worry about the villagers here absolutely overflowing. There's only a small handful of them in this little area down here, and yeah, maybe we'll need to extract a few more of them in future, but for now, not too worried about it.
So we're going to very quickly hop back through to spawn so that I can mention that, of course, our house here has a basement. How can I forget? This was basically my first storage room in the world, and I do like the kind of underground cellar wood shop feel of it. I love the fact that we've got the logs piled up at the end here. That's one of my favorite things. But in here, we do still have a decent amount of supplies just in case we need any of this stuff in future. And to be honest, it's been nice to have an extra space to throw a bit of stone and cobblestone and that kind of stuff when we come back with far too much of it than will actually fit in our storage system and of course we have a brewing setup here in case we need to brew any potions which i have needed to do quite often recently because we've been working on some pretty big and interesting projects the other thing i need to mention while we're over here is also artfully concealed it is the melon and pumpkin farm that we put in a little cliff down here which honestly yeah has made it so that i don't end up checking in on this all that often because i sort of forget that it's there hence returning to it in this video i did come here kind of recently though and we ended up converting a bunch of the melons taking the pumpkins and taking them all over to the village so that I could trade them with the farmers. We can duck in and swim on in here if you want to take a look at the inside of the farm, but it's pretty bare bones. It's just a bunch of observers, pistons, melons, and pumpkins, and it does the job just nicely. The redstone door is a nice touch, though I really like the way that's concealed in the cliff face there. <laughs> One last thing over here on the beach is our music disc farm, starring Dr. Xylophone, who's been hanging out in here for a little while now and farms us music discs occasionally when I feel like trapping a couple of creepers in this setup. We're going to dip back through to the nether but before we go to the guardian farm there is one other farm that we need to check out a little further afield here and on our way we can go past the area where we built an automatic basalt bridging flying machine that made a massive bridge across here but didn't quite take us all the way to a nether fortress over here in the warped forest where we have made one of my favorite farms in this world just because of how productive it is this is a wither skeleton farm built in three crossroad areas of a nether fortress and frankly it is the bee's knees. It's not 100% optimized. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we could do with this in future. We will end up putting wither roses in here to limit the spawns to wither skeletons, but that does require swapping these entire platforms out for netherrack, and it's going to be a whole process. Plus, I don't have a wither rose farm yet, so that's another story entirely. But down here in the trap, we're able to gather a whole bunch of coal, wither skeleton skulls, and bones if we need them. So once again, super happy with this design. A couple of refinements to make in future, but in the meantime, it does the job. Honestly, I think we do need a more organized tunnel to that farm one of these days, because basically every time I fly there, if I haven't been there for a while, I get lost on the way back. Of course, we make it back to the nether hub eventually, and if we head on back in this direction, we should find our way to the guardian farm, which is another farm that's far enough away I end up flying to it through the nether hub. It's not through this portal, because that leads down to a lush cave. That's the old portal to the guardian farming area. This one out here in the slightly more dangerous environment of the soul sand valley is the one we want. But that takes us to the guardian farm, which is still going to tank my frame rate every time I'm here, so I'll probably end up tending my particles down in a second. But this thing is two tanks of soul sand bubble columns and it works splendidly well. I've not needed to AFK for too much prismarine yet because I haven't quite found the right project to build with it, but in combination with the ink farm that we have over at the jungle, which I realize I didn't end up showing in this video, we do have a pretty a decent supply of one of my favorite blocks in the game, dark prismarine. And we finally got an auto sorter set up down here, which means that even if the guardians die automatically down here, they're still providing us with a bunch of prismarine shards and prismarine crystals. Honestly though, when it comes to the other the prismarine blocks, I'm kind of set for a while. We got a lot of them just from taking down the monument and draining the perimeter. The last stop on the tour is naturally going to take us out to the stronghold because where else is the tour going to end but the end. And while we haven't done a whole lot with the end yet, it is home to one of the series' most important farms. That's right, over here, down in this precarious part of the void, we have our Enderman farm. Nembon's Ender Mini, built once again in this world and performing admirably, I gotta say. This is still my number one XP farm in the world, and while we will be building other XP farms in future, I do think this one takes the cake. And it's noisy enough that I sort of don't want to get close to it right now, so we're gonna turn that all the way down to one so that I can repair my tools for the stream that I'm going to be doing later this afternoon. But folks, back at home here at Spawn is where we're going to wrap up this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide, and that's where the tour is going to finish. Thank you so much for watching this tour and the last hundred episodes of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Here is to the next hundred, and oh, <laughs> I didn't realize there was a zombie there. I honestly cannot wait to see how much the world will transform by the time we do a world tour, probably for episode 200 next time. But folks, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pig or ifs don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it subscribe to my channel if you want to see more and i'll see you folks soon take care bye for now